<clears throat> Today we are going to be addressing the newness of kin and culture, kingdom relationships and their influence on the world. Kingdom relationships and their influence on the world. The world around us seems to be falling apart. And we spend a lot of time analyzing and we cast blame in many different directions. And when I say we, I'm talking about the church. The church has a tendency to blame uh, politicians, business owners, culture, professors, teachers. We name and list a whole lot of people and a whole lot of uh, different areas of life for the reason that our country is falling apart. But what I've discovered is that we tend to blame every Thing except the real culprit. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, that's right, we better blame the devil. But I'm not talking about the devil. The Bible actually tells us that it's God's people who are usually to blame for a nation's failure due to a lack of proaction in their faith and their engagement in the affairs of the community or the world. And I believe that that is so true here in our own land. I believe that Christians have disengaged, and they have a private faith, but not a public faith. The number one criticism towards Christians by the world is that they are hypocrites, saying one thing and living another. The world will attribute disunity to us, since we, the body of Christ, tend to not get along. Have you ever noticed that? I think the gooses and the mooses and, and all the other lodges out there tend to have a lot more unity than the body of Christ. We're divided. We're divided on theology. We're divided on methodology. We're divided even in the areas of sociology. We seem to be fighting each other and competing with one another for church members instead of walking together in unity for the cause of Christ and the building of the kingdom of God. And the world sees this, the world recognizes this, and the world laughs at us, the church, because of this. They pay attention. And they pay attention particularly when it comes to world affairs, because they do not see that we are credible enough to have any answers that address public policy or the things of this world. They would prefer for the church to stay internally focused, internally focused, not externally focused, but internally focused. They would prefer that we stay that way and that we tear each other apart from within because they would like to know that we are not ever going to recognize who we really are in God and that we are, as the church, the pillar and ground for truth. And that we are the ones who's holding back judgment from the earth because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Problem is we don't act like it. And we don't become proactive to the degree that we need to be proactive. They're also fully aware of the church's intention to escape the earth, thus having no real buy-in for its restoration. Why would they consult us for the future if there is none for the earth. Now don't get quiet on me because I'm telling you the truth. The church is bought into the idea that we'll give you the present and the earth and we'll take the future in heaven. And because of that we have removed ourselves from any level of real influence in today's world and in today's society. The church has to understand what it means when we say revival. We tend to think that it's signs and wonders and miracles, and while these things are wonderful and should attract people to Christ, revival begins when Christians fall deeply in love with God and with each other. And this is, this is the important thing that God wants us to deal with. He wants us to deal with loving Him and loving others to the point that sin is dealt with in our lives. Unity is created, and then life is released into the world around us. When we begin to fall in love with God in each other, we begin to deal with our own sin of separation, our own sin of pride, our own sin of selfishness. And when those things go, those root issues go, it opens up a whole new door for us. 
to walk through in the area of influence, to walk through in the area of unity, to walk through in the area of releasing life in the world around us. How many of you know the world around us needs life? Paul understood this as he wrote most of the New Testament. He emphasized the kind of life God was looking for in those that he would save. This is why his message of grace is so profound. It is the power within the gospel. Grace is the power within the gospel that sets us free and unto a transformed life. Grace is what transforms us. It is the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So let's turn our attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because I want us to see how the Word of God can make a difference in us and conform us and shape us and mold us and make us into the very thing that God has designed for us. Beginning in verse number 11. Are you there? Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others... But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we care beside ourselves, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. One of the things that stands out in this passage of Scripture for me is that the gospel of grace transforms the mind. The gospel of grace transforms the mind. Now, the gospel of grace is the power that converts the heart. So when we talk about it converting the heart, and we also now start thinking about its transformation of the mind, we must come to understand that the heart is the spiritual center of understanding and thought. In other words, it is the mind. That's what the heart is. The heart is the mind. So when we talk about a heart transformation, we're talking about a mind transformation. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now heart speaks to the spiritual aspect of the mind, and the mind being that which processes and reasons and rationalizes, but any way you slice it and any way you look at it, we must come to the conclusion that the mind is what God is working on in each of us. As a matter of fact, you might have heart trouble, some of you, but most of you have mind trouble. No, not most of you. All of you have mental trouble. Because our problem is in our thought processes and our reasoning and our rationale. We live with carnal minds, and God has brought grace into our life by the presence of Jesus Christ through salvation in order to transform your mind from being a carnal mind to partaking in the divine nature of God. So that it is true when it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It is about the mind. 
So when we say that Christ through salvation changes the heart, we are actually saying that he changes the mind, so much so that one who is truly converted will not think the same way that he once thought. And therefore, you will not walk the same way as you once walked. But rather, you will now walk in faith because your mind has been filled with God. This is the process and the point of salvation. So, the gospel of grace transforms the mind. And it leads to some things. First of all, it leads to a whole new world view. A new world view. Now, what is worldview? Worldview is the view that you have of the world. It's the way in which you process and think. It's the lens through which you see things that are happening around the world, and, and you connect and understand it in that, in, in that framework. It is what you naturally lean towards and naturally process and reason based upon your understanding and what has been developed in your mind processes throughout your life. Worldview, everyone has one. You have a worldview. Now, it might not be the right worldview, but everyone has a worldview in this world. So, what happens is we are born and then we are, we are raised in a certain circumstance, in a certain situation, in a certain arena, an environment where there is all kinds of things that are coming into our heart or coming into our mind. And that's what helps shape your worldview. So as you grow up, you have a particular perspective on life. That is your worldview. However, when we are born again, God comes in and by the power of grace begins to shape a new worldview in you. He begins to change your mind. Now, I often say, and I wrote an article on this not long ago, that it's not about worldview, it's about having a kingdom view of the world. And that's what I believe God does. He begins to work in us, so he begins to change our mind, and he begins to line our thoughts up with his thoughts, our ideas up with his ideas, our reasoning and rationale up with his, so that now we no longer have really what's called a worldview, but rather we have a kingdom view of the world. And that kingdom view is necessary to be translated into this world and into this life. And that agrees with the prayer of Jesus who said, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus pray such a prayer? It is because he had a kingdom view, and therefore it was his desire and prayer that that which he saw as the kingdom would come into reality in this world. He had a kingdom view, and it needed to be translated into the earth. So salvation brings a new worldview. We began to see things differently than we saw things before in our carnal nature and with our carnal mind. True salvation is a product of fearing God. And one of the things that comes with a change of mind is a fear of God. I'm interested in what Paul says here in verse number 11 when he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. He didn't say... Therefore, fearing God, he said, therefore, knowing the fear of God or knowing the fear of the Lord, we then respond to that knowledge by doing something. What is it? We persuade you. You see, what happens when true salvation comes to one's life, suddenly other things come into their mind. And one of the things that comes into the mind is, is the knowledge of, of God to such a degree that it strikes reverential fear in your heart. One of the problems in our world today is people don't fear God. They don't fear God because they have no knowledge of what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is a reverential honor and respect unto God because we know who He is and we really believe who He is. It's not just a story about God or someone's idea about God, but it's that we've come to really know God, and therefore when you know God, you will know the fear of the Lord. And it will compel you. It will persuade you. It will cause you to do things that you would not normally do in your carnality. 
it will drive you and cause you and compel you to live righteously if you know the fear of the Lord. The reason that there are so many who call themselves Christians that are not living the right kind of life is because they have no knowledge of the fear of the Lord. They have no understanding of who really who God is because if you know God, you will know fear. And it's not the kind of fear that we're afraid of. It's the kind of fear that submits. It's the kind of fear that surrenders. It's the kind of fear that recognizes and acknowledges that I'm nothing and he's everything. Therefore, I will become his and his alone. It's the kind of fear that drives and draws you in to that which is good. Knowledge of the fear of the Lord. See, a new world view contains the knowledge of the fear of God. It's, it's a reality of our sinfulness against God and the consequences of that sin. Did you know there are consequences to sin? That's something I don't think that many understand. The fear of God is the power that motivates us to repent. Repentance is a changed mind. It is a changed mind about our ways and about our lives. It results in changed behavior, and then it drives us to a concern and a care for others. One of the things that I just can't understand is how someone can say, I'm a born-again, blood-washed, cross-centered, Christ-focused, redeemed child of the living God, and yet they don't care and have no concern for other people. That's an oxymoron. Maybe it's just a moron. I don't know. <laughs> Throw out the oxy. Bottom line is, it just doesn't compute in God's realm. Because those who are saved and born again are so excited and so thrilled and so enthusiastic over their own salvation, they want everybody to be saved. They want everybody to be converted and transformed by the power of the grace of God. And so we have a concern and a care. You see, that's what happens when we fear God. Because when we have the knowledge of the fear of the Lord, we recognize that there are people who are lost, who are going to experience the consequences of their sin unless they allow Jesus to take care of them. And so we are driven by a new worldview. You see, the fear of God is something that true believers form a relationship with. Now think about that for a moment. We form a relationship with the fear of the Lord. I think that what that does is it takes it to another level. It suddenly actually becomes us and we become it. We become the fear of the Lord. That's what Paul uh, was talking about here. For he had shared with the people about the evaluation of one's life according to their commitment and service to Christ. He mentioned it in verses earlier than verse 11. If we'd have started reading a little higher up in your Bible, you would have recognized that Paul was talking to them about the judgment that was coming. And the judgment that was coming was about the judgment upon their works. Not, not upon their lives as lost people, but upon their works as saved people. And that he was talking about how that he wanted really to finish well and that he wanted to, to be honorable before the Lord. And then he says in verse number 11, he says, therefore. Now the word therefore is very important in the scripture. Anytime you see that word, it connects what's about to be said with what was just previously said. Because of this, therefore, he says... It is knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade you. Why did he want to persuade them? Because he knew that now there was a responsibility for him and the disciples to serve God and draw people into a relationship with God. Otherwise, they would give an account for what they failed at. As a matter of fact, he feared God because he knew the consequences of such a situation. So Paul had literally developed a relationship with the fear of the Lord, so much so he knew the fear of the Lord. That word know really means intimacy. He had an intimate knowledge of the fear of the Lord. I believe it began on the road to Damascus. You remember the story of how Paul was riding his white horse, his high horse, and God knocked him off his high horse. 
which is what he did to you and I when he came and found us. And I believe that that event in Paul's life was so significant and so scary, but yet at the same time so powerful that he understood that this really was God. This wasn't just an angel. This wasn't just some kind of mystical experience, but rather this is the God who created everything that is. And therefore, it penetrated his heart, that experience on the Damascus Road. It seared something deep inside of him to the degree that he now had a, a passion for everyone else to have a same experience as he had on the Damascus Road. So you see, what happened with Paul was that he had an intimate encounter with the fear of the Lord. So he could say, knowing the fear of the Lord, I am now here to persuade you. Oh, that we could all be able to say that. Paul said, it is my responsibility, it is my calling, but it is my honor. It is my honor to serve the Lord in this way. And this relationship with a healthy fear of God motivated him daily. It motivated him to approach life much differently than before his salvation experience. Before, he was killing the Christians. Now, he was trying to rescue people into Christianity. Because he understood this God now. Not only persuaded him to live differently, but it also motivated him, motivated him to draw others in. I, I was reading an example story about Stuart Hamlin, an old songwriter from years ago. Some of you old-timers might remember Stuart Hamlin. He wrote country and western songs, and uh, before he got saved, he wrote a song entitled, I won't go hunting with you, Jake, but I'll go women chasing. That's the kind of songs he wrote. Sounds like a country song, doesn't it? But soon afterwards, Stuart gave his life to the Lord. And a friend of his by the name of John Wayne, the Duke, made a bet with him. And that bet was that you won't last six months in your newfound faith. You won't last. Sometime after the six months, Stuart saw John Wayne again and said, uh, you know, hey, you, 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 you got some money for me? And uh, John Wayne said, you know, because he knew the story, he knew how his life had changed, and it, the time was up, and he remembered the bet. And uh, he said, yeah, 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 you, you, you've cost me some money here. And Stuart said, well, uh, it's no secret what God can do. And as a result of that, he wrote the song. He went home, and he wrote the song, It Is No Secret What God Can Do as a result of that little encounter. But what I'm saying is this, is that the power of God is able to reach down and save anyone. And the power of grace brings the fear of the Lord into a life that causes it to stick and to cause you to be steadfast and firm in your faith. The problem sometimes is that we take our eyes off of the mark. We take our eyes off of the Lord or, or, we, or we seem to, to be drawn away by, by those things that we've allowed to grow in us more than the things that should grow in us. We feast on things in life that either grow us negatively or grow us positively. Are you hearing me? We need to feast on the Word of God. The Word of God will feed you and grow you up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and it will keep you in the fear of the Lord, and it will keep you motivated to persuade others, and it will cause you to stand when everyone else is falling away. Because the Bible says that in the last days, latter days, there's going to be a great revival, but there's also going to be a great falling away. It's God drawing a line down the middle as he did there at Mount Sinai with Moses and the children of Israel, and he's going to say, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come over. And if we don't have an intimate knowledge with the fear of the Lord, we won't answer properly. You see, it's about a fear of God, but it's also about a faith in God. Ministry that praises Him every step we take. There ought to be a praise associated with that step. The fear of God produces faith in God. F faith in God produces a different lifestyle toward everyone else in this life. As a matter of fact, true salvation gives you new eyes to see others in a different light. Husbands will view their wives the proper way. Children will be seen properly. Wives will see their husbands and kids differently. Relationships will change because what? Our minds have been made new. We are no longer thinking the same old way. 
I was, I was really interested when I heard um, Ted Cruz speaking. And Ted Cruz, who's a Republican senator and possibly a presidential candidate for 2016, and he was sharing, and one of the things he said was that when he was three years old, his father, who's now a pastor, by the way, uh, his father left his mother, got on a plane and flew from Canada to Houston, Texas, didn't want to be married anymore, didn't want to be a father. And so his father flew back to, to Houston and there went to work and was working for the uh, gas company. And a friend of his that he worked with invited him to come to a Bible study. And so he went to this Bible study at a Baptist church. And it was there that Bible study that Ted Cruz's father gave his heart to Jesus. Ted Cruz's father got on a plane, flew back uh, to Canada where they were living at the time, and reunited with a wife and, and became the kind of father that uh, God wanted him to become. And so Ted Cruz said, I grew up with a father. What would have happened if Jesus had not transformed my father's life? Where would I be today? You see, it, it, is, it is something profound when Jesus comes in because Jesus changes our life. He changes our mind. He changed Ted Cruz's father's mind. He got on a plane, flew all the way back, and became the husband and the father that he should be. That's what Jesus will do for you. But the very, mere fact that husbands aren't right and wives aren't right indicates that Jesus isn't Lord. Because when Jesus is Lord, we're going to be right with each other as well. This is what faith does to us. Relationships will change. A true indication of a false profession is the obvious lack of a new understanding with regard to relational integrity. If you don't like people, if you don't love people, if you don't care for people, if you're not concerned for people, sometimes we say, well, that's just my personality. I, I can't help the way I am. Jesus did everything to help the way you are. On the day of Pentecost, those disciples, those apostles got up, and they were different than the way they naturally were. What made the difference? I'll tell you what made the difference. The power of the Holy Spirit made the difference. They began to be bold and brazen, and, and as a matter of fact, they were, they were so different than what they had been hiding out in an upper room and hiding out since the time Jesus had left that people thought they were drunk. They thought they had lost their minds. Who are these crazy people? People ought to have that same opinion of us. Who are these bold, enthusiastic, passionate, crazy uh, people who are having such a good time, but they're so passionate and in love with us, and they care? And they're sharing the good news of Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes the difference. There's not a single one in this room who has, has more opportunity to make those same kind of excuses, as do I. Because, you know, you would never know this probably because of my loud mouth up here every Sunday. But when I was growing up, I was timid backwards. I was so backwards, I would never even open my mouth. I was the one who never would look you in the eye. I was this shy, timid little boy who, who would never, ever want to be called to attention or out front. And that happened all the way up through my childhood and even into my teen years. And it, and it took some crisis in my family where I had to step forward and become a man that I began to see a different way forward. And then when God touched my life... He, he, put a, he put Red Bull in me or something. I don't know what he did. He injected something. I tell you, I'll tell you what it is. It's the grace of God that he injected into my heart and into my mind. And suddenly, boldness came. Passion came. Enthusiasm came in order to be a leader and to do something differently than what my natural person was all about. So we cannot excuse ourselves because this is my DNA, this is my demeanor, this is my personality. No, God can make a difference in you. Come on, look at somebody and tell them God can make a difference in you. We need to be willing to change. Faith is not only defined by trust and belief in Christ, but it's also the power and the promise that is given that we embrace for change. You depend upon the Word of God. We trust the Word of God. If God says He's going to do something, how many of you know He'll do it? I trust Christ to make me new every day. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. Do I mess up? Yes. Am I the problem in the, in the problem? Yes. 
But my heart's desire is that he make me new every day. Now, how can I have a heart's desire like that? Who put the desire there? If I'm naturally carnal, who put the desire there? I'll tell you who put it there. He did. He put a desire in me to want to be like him. Because if it were up to me, I would desire other things. But he's put a desire there. Now, it's my longing to be like Jesus. I trust him to work in me the power of grace that converts me and converts my thought process about everything. He changes your mind about everything. Therefore, a change of mind produces a change of attitude and a change of behavior that is expressed outward into all areas of life. The life that now exists is a life of praise to the one who rescued me from my sin and rescued me from myself. Some of you need rescuing from yourself. Yourself is the greatest enemy that you have. Stop blaming the devil for the things you do. Well, the devil made me do it. We don't have a Flip Wilson theology around here. The devil didn't make you do anything. You did it because you wanted to do it. You see, I, I'm also compelled by what has happened to me so that I can live my life as an example to persuade others to come to Christ. Now, I'm going to close with this. Paul uses a wonderful phrase about his the disciples' passion for God. And he also talks about reasonable thinking towards others. I love this phrase. If you'll notice it, he says, he says the phrase, beside ourself. You notice that? Let me, let me make sure that you know which verse it is. Let me go back to the beginning here in my notes, where my passage of Scripture is. Which verse is it? 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is because of God. It's, we're beside ourselves for God. And if we're in our right mind, then it's for you. I love that. There's a phrase we use today is, you know, when someone says, well, I'm just beside myself. What does that mean? It means you're, over, you're overjoyed, you're, you're excited, you're so enthusiastic you can't contain it. You, you just, you, you have just, poof, you become two people. Now, you're beside yourself. You've doubled, you've increased. And, and I love this because I, I think this is where we get this phrase from, is that Paul says, if we are beside ourselves, it's because of God. He has, he has done something in me that has caused me to be so overjoyed that I can't contain it. It's going to take two of me to, to fill it up. But if we're in our right mind, then it's because of you. In other words, what he's saying here is he's saying that there is an un, there, there, there's this un, unreasonable passion. In other words, you can't reason. It's a passion that you can't explain, you can't understand. It just comes because of the grace and the glory and the wonder of God. But there's also this, this reasonable thinking towards others. Paul said that he was there to persuade them. Because, you see, if they were only beside themselves for God and they were unreasonable with others, people would have just thought they were crazy people. But they had to be beside themselves for God, but also clear in the way in which they presented God to those who didn't have the same excitement and enthusiasm yet, so they wouldn't understand. They have to catch it. They have to catch it because there was a presentation, there was a persuasion, as Paul says, that it is. And so, this is something that, when and it came to others, they were able to use reasonable thought in communicating the work of Christ on man's behalf. In other words, salvation gives us an uncontrollable passion to praise and worship God while spiritually and intelligently able to focus on leading others to Christ. This gives us great understanding of how our lives are to be lived. Amen? So, here's the point of today's partial message. Looks like I'm going to start my next series late because I didn't finish this message. But I'm going to get you out of here, here in just about two, three minutes. Listen to me, though. In summary, the grace of God transforms the mind. The mind that is transformed has a different worldview. If you still think the same way 
you thought before you prayed thinking you accepted Jesus, then I'm wondering if you really got Jesus. Because he changes the way we think. It has to start there. He doesn't change your behavior. He changes the way you think. Because your thinking will eventually change your behavior. Right? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You become what you think. So God changes your thinking first. And if your thinking hasn't changed, why should we expect that your behavior will? Why should we expect your attitude to be any different? Why should we expect that your demeanor and, uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be righteous if your heart has not been graced by God? A new worldview. A worldview that includes the knowledge of the fear of God. And it's the fear of God that not only keeps your mind conforming and changing every day to become more Christ-like, but it's a fear of God that also takes that mindset and drives it out into your activities and your actions and your behaviors. It is the fear of God that compels me to serve. It is the fear of God that compels me to preach. It is the fear of God that compels me to witness. It is the fear of God that compels me to go to foreign lands and, and bring people to Christ. It is the fear of the Lord that persuades me, as Paul was persuading others because of his intimate knowledge of the fear of the Lord. Amen? I hope... God has spoken to you today. Let's pray.